and uh, I'm looking for the notes they have on here. They have all this kind of, uh, you know, it, it, the effects were just uh, huge. The seismic wave kept going on for four years, but the worst was over after six months. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. think, think what I said. No, every day another building is collapsing. You get what I'm saying? They thought it's the wrath of God. Uh, one month after the earthquake, a powerful new shock hit the city in December 5th, 1570. This time, the battered the palazzo, this and this church and that, and all these places were spared. A new shock in January 12, 1571, damaged the Mon uh, palazzo Monte Cuccoli. Oh my goodness, you know, all over the place. Um, and, it, it, and it showed people were scared by the disaster. One third of the population left the city for good. City jails collapsed, and the prisoners escaped the rubble, which led to a crime spree in the city and countryside. Sounds like Baltimore. You understand? <laughs> Okay, earthquake lights were seen above the city on November 15th. Earthquake lights, I don't even know what that is. And the night before the quake, flames were reported to come out of the ground and raise into the air, probably small pockets of natural gas set free by cracks in the dust. Okay, but if I'm living there and I see the devil coming out of the ground, you know, coming home from chakras, I'm like, whoa, what did we do? You know, the earthquake struck at dawn, three strong shocks at the city in the first day, and so on and so on and so forth. You know, I mean, they, we, they, this was uh, very closely uh, recorded. Now, listen to this. Uh, there's no such thing as a disaster out of which somebody cannot make hay. And the Pope uses this to attack the pro-Jewish policies of the Duke. You understand? The Duke asked the Pope Pius for help. Uh, Hercules, uh, Alonso, Alfonso, at least a public blessing to the city. He got nothing except a firm reprimand for not having persecuted the city's Jews well enough. Therefore, well deserving God wrath to the city. That's a nice guy, right? Uh, Alfonso's answer was prompt, pointing out the evident natural cause of the disaster and discharging any, any allegation against blaming the Jews. Here's where I'm going. If you're Jewish and you're living in the early 1570s, you want to emphasize the scientific side of things, don't you? <laughs> Get what I'm saying? No, don't, no, I'm serious. Don't be surprised if this is going to make a guy who's anyway a rationalist, all the rest of it, say, you know, uh, the Pope's rebuttal was a blunt political maneuver meant to undermine Alfonso's authority by exploiting discontented minorities. Since the city administration tolerated the presence of the assassins of Jesus, God was justifiably angry toward the whole city. Full blame is put in the head of the, of the Duke and none of the Jews, etc., 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 right? Along with this Pope's stern letter, emissaries from the Capuchin monks were sent from Bologna in order to scare the population and turn against the Duke. The friars took some decomposing corpses from the rubble, brought them in procession, claiming God was going to sink the city to, to hell if the people refused to drive the, the Duke away. Oh my goodness, back and forth and forth and back. So uh, you can see it's quite a time to uh, live in. Now, uh, what happens over here? Um, since the Pope says... It's called science, you jerk, you know? I said it wrong. The Duke says it's called science. So the Catholic Church is running around saying it's, it's, it's act of God. Azari de Rossi is moved to consider the earthquake, which he writes up in Hebrew. That comes the first part of his book. A whole famous long description of the earthquake in Hebrew, uh, in which obviously he wants to side with the Duke. And what does that mean? Of course God's run the Teva, you know, ultimately, but the Teva runs on its own. You see, everything comes from God, but there's also nature and science. You blame it on geology, don't blame it on God. Or can you? You know, this is a tricky business. Um, a couple years ago, when you had the Haiti earthquake, I remember Heshi Weiner from the OU said, I guess, it's, 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 earthquakes have their own logic. You know, don't blame it on God. You follow? No, there's this natural tendency. It was in Jewish times. You have this natural tendency to ascribe these sorts of things. Um, this started Azaria writing about things that interested him. First about earthquakes, and then about history questions. So when he was running away from the earthquake across the river, he met this non-Jewish fellow, and the guy asked him, he said, what's the Jewish opinion about the letter of Aristeus? The letter of Aristeus is a part of what we call the pseudepigrapha, which means it's an account of how they translated the Torah into, into Greek. Now, the Gemara has a famous story I'm sure many are familiar with, which is Ptolemy. Ptolemy II, the king of Egypt, took the rabbis and put them in, seven, in, in 70 different rooms, trying to mess them up, and miraculously it didn't work out that way. They even were machavan to the same choices. We all know that story. That's version one. Then there's a totally separate version uh, in Greek, uh, purporting to be by a Gentile official of the Egyptian court, which says, Dear Aristeus, since you, uh, the letter of Philocrates to Aristeus, so Philocrates says, I just want you to know the king the other day decided he wanted to add the library, the, the book of the Jews to the library. He sent me as head of an emissary, an embassy to Jerusalem, and he describes visiting Jerusalem, and he describes how the base of, it's fascinating, and he describes how the base of Migdus runs, and he runs into Kohen Gadol, and they conduct very courteous negotiations, and he gives him a present, he gives him a present, and the end is they persuade the rabbis to come down to Egypt, and they go to a page and page and page 
stages where the king entertains them at a banquet, and the banquet is full of wise philosophical sayings. It's a symposium. It's sort of like what the Seder originally was. And that is, you know, Eza uh, Chacham. Uh, Eza Gibor, I mean Eza Ashir. Uh, who do you Jews consider wise? What is the ugliest of the animals? What is the wisest of the days? You know those kind of you know w- Greek wisdom sorts of things. And the rabbis, of course, knock a, a home run at each one. And then when it's all over, then they say like this: they, the king said, "Oh, very nice." And then they retire to an island and they write up the whole thing, and everybody's happy. So. Uh, the answer is, Chazal never heard of this. No, you don't get a bit of this anywhere. In the, it's not from religion whatsoever. And so he's, Azariah said, I guess, I think Jews ought to know about this. this he, as far as he knows, it's a guy writing in the glory of Judaism. And so he translates that, a letter of Aristides. It took him 20 days. And so now he has the makings of a book. He has the, descri- descri- uh, the description of the uh, earthquake in Ferrara. He has the letter of Aristeus. And then he decides more controversially, to put in his 60 essays. Again, again, the 60 essays. What are 60 essays? Um, history questions, okay? Where did I put it? It's a fat book. This is in English, right? It's a, it's a fat book. And by the way, you know, it's all words. <laughs> no pictures, okay? <laughs> so uh, the vast majority of it is the 60 essays. You understand? And... Uh, now I'm going somewhere with this. The 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 the, the point he he has this consideration of Philo, and who exactly is this guy Philo? Was he in the Pharisees or the Sadducees and all that kind of stuff? Because I'll never write about him. But you know, uh, some of the things Philo says about halacha are the same thing you find in the Talmud, and some things are different. Does that mean he was from? Does that mean he was not from? Dr. Belkin later on used to write dissertations about this. Uh, what's the story with Josephus? And why did Josephus write another version as he understood it called Yosephon? And why did he leave things in and one and out the other? Then he has a preoccupation with the big day kahuna, of all things. He's got a couple of chapters where he talks about the exact nature of the priestly vestments. One thing led to the other, and he began to write about historical issues that bothered him in relation to the Gemara. Now, I'm not going to go through 60 things tonight. Among these, the two, I'll, go, I'll go right to the core. The two trickiest subjects were Agathas that seemed to be historically inaccurate. That's number one. And number two, the traditional chronology of the Chazal. What do you do when the Gemara tells a story that seems to be untrue based on what we know from Gosh history? That's the question. What about, most famously, Titus and the bug that went up the nose? Everybody, I'm sure, knows the story that after the base of Megas was destroyed, it's in the Talmud and the Medrash and a couple places like that. It says that Titus uh, mocked God and he said, I can take, I, I, I burned your temple down. And God says, oh, a tiniest creature will mess you up. And a bug went up his nose and uh, stayed there, a bug, right? A, a, a gnat. And grew and grew and grew. And, by the, and, and it never left him. And for the rest of his life, Titus lived in torment. There's a whole description about it. You know, I won't go through all the stories. Uh, torment and eventually killed him. And when he died from it years later, after many years of excruciating torment, uh, they opened, they did autopsy, the Gemara says, and they opened it up and they found a bird with iron uh, fingers, you know, uh, uh, claws. They ripped him up and it was just amazing. And here's his Ross saying, huh? Uh, I mean, Titus was a historical character. We got all these Roman writers that write about, you know, I mean, he, he's not an unknown guy. Uh, there are plenty of people around in his reign and there are plenty of historians, if you want, or chroniclers from the Roman times to write about the life and death of Titus, he died from a certain plague. There are those who tie his brother, poisoned him. Very possible if you know the Romans. That's a different thing. But come on, if there was a bug in the thing, it would have, it would, it would have, somebody would have written about all this. I mean, you're telling me it's a grand conspiracy of silence. This is the sort of thing that, that bothers Isaiah de Rossi. You understand? Know it's the kind of question that nobody ever brought up before. Rashi and Tosis, oh, writing in the, in the 10 hundreds, the 11 hundreds, aren't interested in these questions at all. What's bothering Tosis is only the question like this. How can it be that the animal scratched away in his head? A trefa is only supposed to live 12 months. That's the definition of a trefa. Here we have somebody from the Vatikasha. And, you know, and therefore, and therefore, if it plucked a crumb, neck of a crumb of you know, if it, if, it, if it had a hole in the, in the brain, then Titus shouldn't have lived on for years and years and years. And, you know, so, and what I mean to say is like this. Rashi and Tosis aren't interested in the other question. They, they treat the text as is. You get it? Um, but as I read he said like this, what is this? Titus, as far as we can tell, this, I'm telling you what he writes, as far as we can tell, he didn't die from all this, so why would they have a story like this? Must mean they made it up. You know what he said? It must mean they made it up. Why would they make up a story like this? To convey to the masses the idea that he got his just desserts in the end. I know how he died. He died 12 years. He was Tucker Young when he died, and uh, don't think that he uh, got away with it. Uh, and therefore, it's a vivid way of telling. You can definitely understand why a lot of people would be ticked off 
but with that approach, but that's very typical of the way he writes. And he always says like this, you know, I think it's a myth. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. He said, you know, he said like this. He said, I'm just giving it my, 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 my best shot. And uh, well, well I'll, I'll come back to this before I'm done. The other biggest and even more controversial problem, I guess you might say, with the chronology, okay? And here, uh, excuse me, you run into the problem that according to Chazal, there are three kings of Persia, right? Maybe four, but, you know, basically three kings of Persia. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, from Cyrus and Achishirish all together, uh, Achishirish is 14 years, Cyrus, I forget, like five or some years, uh, you know, uh, uh, and the guy after him, it doesn't say clear, all together, if I remember correctly, all together is about 50 years, okay? And then comes Alexander the Great and the overthrow of the Persian Empire, and you move on. The problem, is, that's, that's what the Seder Olam says. The Seder Olam is the official chronology book of the Gemara. That's the Gemara quote, Tanar Rabbanon. Gemara quotes it all the time, okay? According to the regular historians, by which I mean the Greeks, because there are no regular historians in ancient times. So you have people like Herodotus and Thucydides and people like that, especially Herodotus and others. The Persians didn't leave a whole lot of records, I just want you to know. He says, according to them, there are 10 kings. There's this, let me, look at now, whoa. <laughs> it's not 50 years, it's, uh, you know, almost 200 years, whatever, more, right? So what's this, uh, 220 years? It's a, it's a long time. And, I mean, we have dates and stuff about all of them. Uh, I'll give you an example. Xerxes is the Battle of Thermopylae and the 300 Spartans and the invasion of Athens and the defeat by, by, by the Greeks at, the, at, at Salamis. I mean, you've heard of some of these things in school. Um, there are extensive discussions about Greek wars and stuff like that with these kings as they go down the line. You understand? Uh, Darius III, who's killed, uh, killed in the wars against Alexander the Great, very famous. So basically, uh, Zayed Ross saying, what's going on over here? It's like telling me like this. There was George Washington, there was John Adams, there was Thomas Jefferson, and then there was Kennedy. <laughs> he said, what about all the guys in the middle? It didn't exist. But we have all this kind of, it didn't exist. You, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, a, it's a problem. And so, uh, so what do you do with all this? So Isaiah de Rossi is the first guy to say like this, we're wrong, they're right, get over it. Just like the Ram, no, he did what the Rambams did in science. He applies to history, okay? Now, by the way, it's a problem, and there are people to this day trying to write books all the time to, 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 to foreign for this. Uh, here's a guy from YU, I don't know him, from Teaneck, we just did a study of it, Jewish history and conflict, the study of the major discrepancy between rabbinic and conventional chronology. And he did, it's really cute. You see all the writers that ever come since then, up to and including Art Scroll, and what, do they, do they uh, fudge it? Uh, do they go over it? Do they ignore it? Do they talk about it? Or, who says we're right and they're wrong? Who says they're right and we're wrong? You know, and all the rest of who, who says both are right? Who says neither are right? Here's a book I just picked up in Shopsies. Uh, two, three weeks ago, the challenge, I, I, don't, I haven't even read it yet, the challenge of Jewish history, the Bible, the Greeks, and the missing 168 years by somebody named Alexander Hull, who I think is a yeshiva guy in Israel, or something like this. And, he, and uh, you know, just from the little I skimmed through it, he went deep into the sources. And I'm, I'm serious about it. Those people to this day are trying to grapple, everybody's a holy grail. If you could forever this kasha, whoa, that would be pretty good. Now, I just want you to know, the Art Scroll, you should notice, in this book that they published many years ago in the 80s, I think, hold on, uh, from Rabbi Goldworm, if anybody remembers him, Olav Shalom, who was a big Talmud Kalkum, and, and he, he knew a lot of secular things as well, he's a serious guy, has a two-page business at the end of the book called The Traditional J Jewish Chronology, in which he discusses this gap. No, he doesn't hide from it, except he says, we're right and they're wrong. You know, and, 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 he, and he makes an argument for it. I'm just uh, t uh, telling you that. He wants to say over here, Zayi Rossi with a from guy, and he decided with the from. That's not true. But, uh, you know, basically, he does, I mean, to, to the credit, you know, they, present, they present the issue. Rabbi Schwab, of all people, very famously said, uh, I'll say again, he speculated. He said, I guess I'm guessing. You know, I'm just suggesting, I'm guessing. In, the, uh, in, in 1962, in the Jubilee volume for Rabbi Breuer, Rabbi Schwab was, as you know, rabbi in Baltimore before he went to uh, Washington Heights. And when he was in Baltimore, I'm talking about the 40s and 50s, he used to deal with a lot of Hopkins students and people like that. And I've asked him, but people must have brought this stuff up. You understand? And being, uh, you know, he, he's, uh, so he has a whole uh, discussion of it in which you won't believe this. He concludes at the end, uh, they're right and we're wrong, but there's a reason. 
Okay, the Chazal on purpose uh, fudged it because of something he says in the book of Daniel. Uh, now, if you take that, and he says like this, he says, I don't know, maybe I'm right, I'm just, this is a guess. You know, that's what he writes in the, in the essay. If you take that point of view, then you don't have to worry about all this kind of thing. Then you're saying, okay, you know, we're wrong, but it's, it's deliberate. By the way, if it's true, this is not the year 5775. It's more like, what, it's closer to 6,000, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's uh, more like 50, 59. <laughs> and it's not 75. <laughs> Kiss it goodbye, baby, you know? Uh, we're getting ready for the big. But you want to know something? Look at the ISIS. I mean, <laughs> I hope Rabbi Schwab is wrong, you know what I mean? But, uh, but, 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 but who knows? All I'm telling you is that uh, Azariah de Rossi said, like this, said, get over it. Now, um, Azariah said like this, look, I'm just analyzing what's out there. Don't shoot me. I'm laying it out there. I didn't invent the, the list of 10 Persian kings, you know? I didn't invent the Peloponnesian Wars and, and all the stuff that happened in the 5th century BC. You know, don't shoot me, Okay. What he was saying, and this in the Renaissance, was that the truths of historical analysis trump the truths of tradition. That Western discourse trumps Jewish discourse. Of course, he always says, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. This is just the fruits of my reason. That's his way of, of always backing out of it. Well, the book came out in the 1570s in Mantua, and all hell broke loose. Okay? Uh, Italian rabbis divided into two types. One group criticized specific points in his writing, accusing him of being wrong on certain facts and analysis. That's what we call a book review. There's nothing wrong with that. Agree? That's, the, you know, that's uh, every scholar in the world uh, actually should welcome that. Um, the other larger group accused him of kafira, of being a kafir, an unbeliever and a heretic. Okay? The whole approach is heretical. This is not what we do. Right? This is the Jewish religion. I know who you are. And what was particularly disturbing is Number one, he's a from guy. Number two, he's a Talmud Chacham. He was a member of the Jewish elite class. You understand? He wasn't an alienated Jew who had nothing. He was a member of the community, you know, like we say, he's a Balkari or something. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a, a central figure in Mantua, in Bologna, in Ferrara. Um, he always had been known for being like that, but it's a different story, you know, talking in the tea on a Tuesday night with a friend, just shooting the bull and speculating on that and putting it out that this is what I think is the uh, truth. Okay? So the, lar the larger group want to put him in Kherim. And uh, Azariah acted surprised. Now, he couldn't have really been surprised. Or maybe he was. It was just dumb. But I don't, I don't think so. Uh, this is not a dumb person we're talking about over here. I think he viewed himself... Now, I'm just sharing my opinion. I think he viewed himself as being on the left of the spectrum of acceptable opinion and not beyond the pale. Okay? There is something of an argument for this, but it's a very tricky argument. Uh, the Jewish religion covers a lot of people. And there are people here, here, and here. And we have never been a people who have insisted or been able to insist, maybe until recently, that you have to have one specific ashkafa. But rather, the idea has always been that there's something of a range out there, left-wingers, right-wingers, as long as you're within the range and you observe the mitzvahs, you're part of the cl club. You understand? So I'm, I'm going to use terms that I don't really mean. Uh, it's Lakewood and YU. You know, just, not that that's a real thing, but you know, you, that, that kind of general idea. And you say, this one's a little more modern. This show, oh, it's very much like this. That show is very like that. But they're all the orthodox shows. You understand? This was um, a well-known concept throughout the medieval Jewish history. And uh, I'll tell you the positive side of it, uh, not the negative. I'll tell you the positive side of it. And that is, that way people have issues with this and that and the other can feel, this is a peerage that speaks to me. A guy say, when I read Rashi and the Chumash, it, it drives me crazy. When I read the Ralbag, who's all the way out in left field. So I see, okay, I feel valid. You know, somebody else holds like me. So if they say, the Billum's donkey talk. It's hard for me to accept Billum's donkey talk. But I see that the Rabbah or somebody else said it's just a marshal. Oh, good. Maybe he's right. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe I wasn't there, right? Maybe it happened. Maybe it didn't happen. But I feel good that somebody else holds like this. Now, the person right next to him, right, in the same shul throughout history, was like, yes, that's Kfira. The Rabbah was crazy. You know, it's not true. Bill and Tunky spoke. Anybody who says that. And, and, and that's called a Jewish conversation, <laughs> right? It's, it's kiddish after a shul. You understand? No, man, man, but this really is true. In Spain, in Provence, certainly in Italy, sometimes among the Sephardim when they had the intellectuals, you know, this, this, this conversation we'll have over there. 
the masses are not really part of that conversation. You get what I'm saying? It's a highly elitist, Mandarin sort of social phenomenon in which the th we three people in shul, we four people, the only people, everybody else, eh, you know, but we know that, and you really believe this, and, then, and, and one will say, how can you say not? I'm sure, and the other will say this, and, and you know, and we, and we agree to disagree, and then we bench. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then we, and, and then we, and then, then we go on, and something like that. That's a, but that's one thing, putting it in a book and saying, this is, my, you know, this is the Torah's Moshe, so to speak, or at least my, what I think, is a different story. So, he felt clearly that what he's, he's totally aware that he's on the left wing of, um, of the spectrum. He has complete contempt for the masses, obviously, because he's, for crying out loud, he's a 16th century Jewish intellectual, you know. Um, so he doesn't have anything. But what I just said fluctuates with time and space, correct? The conversation I had might happen in this place and might happen in that place. It's not going to happen in Meisharim in 1975. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not going to happen in Punavish based Medrash. In, 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 in 2000, you know? It will happen in another show. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? In other words, there are places where this sort of thing has happened, places where it happened. It wouldn't happen with Samson Raphael Hirsch, as we'll see. It would absolutely happen with Israel Hildesheimer, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, in Italy, where he grew up in Mantua, the left-wing Rosh Hashiva, Judah Messer Leon, put a cherim on the Raubag, Back in the 1470s, this is funny. That's that's why you declaring YCT Traif. You get what I'm saying? You know that that that, that no that, that that that's what it was. You follow? Because even there, there's a wonderful uh, tape. Maybe some of you heard it. Rabbi Ruderman being interviewed by the Chavos Chaim guys. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody familiar with this? And uh, there's one. <laughs> anyway, uh, some some Chavos Chaim guys talk, had conversation in English. You know, he's trying to talk to them in English, you know, in his accent. And they're saying, like, and they said all kinds of things, some which were smart, some which were not. And one of the things they said is, like, what's with the uh, Rambam and the Mordevuchim? These are not studying Yeshiva and the Rosh Yeshiva. Rabbi Rudim is like, yes, you have to know uh, what he means. Uh, you know, the Rambam is good, but you have to understand what he means. And what about, they said, like, this, the Kuzri, oh, Avada, you know. And what about Chazde Kresses? He's good, you have to understand. What about the Ralbag? The Ralbag is nicht good. <laughs> Right? So that's his thing. But I can tell you right now, the Rabbug is, I'm just off the top of my head, Rabbug's in the Mikras Gadolas. You understand know what I'm saying? It published the most Rabbug. I'm just trying to show you that there are outliers on the right, outliers on the left. And uh, Zadie de Rossi wanted to say like this, I'm part of the club. I just, I just occupy the left because that, because that's where my research leads me. Uh, but to Italian Jews, it's, uh, you know, the, the Azari is now the new Rabbug, so to speak. Now, like Steinsaltz, uh, Azari de Rossi did not win a war. That's not who he was. And so he published a book. He says, I'm apologize if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And if I offended anybody, I'm shutting up. Was this tongue in cheek? I mean, it had to be. You understand? He issues a new edition of the book, like Stalin's encyclopedia. Get it? Notice the, the pages are uh, changed. You know what I mean? They tore the, the, the parts out over there. So don't shoot me. It reminds me very much similarly what happened recently with this. Look at it. The new improved edition. <laughs> Anybody know you know what I'm talking about? I think, by the way, Rabbi Yaakov's uh, yard set is this week. He says... Uh, uh, first, they came out with the biography of Yaakov Kamenetsky from his, grand, from his son, uh, and it was too unacceptable. So then he said, I guess, okay, they published another one. In the first edition, uh, I said this in Shul today, I'll never forgive myself, I'm still kicking myself. I went to Shabsi's when the first book came out, and I saw it, I said, eh, I'm not going to waste my time with that. I could be a millionaire. <laughs> uh, so, so he issues a new edition and all that sort of thing. This satisfies the Italian rabbis, believe it. Because they, they were so weak, and, this, and the guy was so tough on them, they're not looking for an internal Jewish war. As long as the guy backs off, as long as he's not publicly and deliberately persisting in challenging the Hashkafic status quo, the Hashkafic consensus, then he's part of the Tzibor. You know, we'll grumble about him, but that's what Jews do. Um, and that's what scared uh, Azari de Rossi more than anything else. He is no Spinoza. I mean, he don't want to excommunicate and ran out of the community. He, he wants to dive in the Mincha, you know what you know, I mean? Like I say, he wants to be the Balkari next week or, or, or the Balshachris or something like that. Um, the book arrived in, Isra in Israel uh, not long after this, okay, because a lot of communication in these years, uh, all the famous books of Riyosu Kara published in Venice, you get it? And financed by Menachem Mazari de Fano, who, and Fano was right next to Ferrara. So Menachem Mazari de Fano was the one who is issues a criticism of the writings of Azaria de Rossi. And so, Alicia um, Galico gets a hold of it. Alicia Galico is an Italian Jew who, 
who, like we say, they flipped and went to Lakewood, you know. So he moved to Tzfat, and he became part of the yeshiva. And the Bay's Din of Yosef Karo. Yosef Karo in Tzfat in the 1500s, that is the acme of orthodoxy, my friends. Okay, that is where it goes. And uh, he says like this, he says, uh, look at this book. And Yosef Karo sees it, and he reads a couple of pages, absolutely shocked. And he says over here, you write up the Kherim, I'll sign it. This book should be burned. In fact, the author should be burned. All this stuff should be done to death. The day he's supposed to sign it, he dies. Rebiyazu Karo. Okay? Yesh Darshan Lishwach, Yesh Darshan Lagadai. You understand? Ever since then becomes a controversy. Uh, some say, see, he was ready to condemn it, therefore the book is totally objectionable and should be burned even today. Others, you'll be surprised, like him. The Stechemin. They say, if he passed away before he signed it, it must be a sign from heaven that the book was okay. You understand? Read with caution, but well, you know, the, 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 the book is okay. Final disposition. The book can be read, the Italian rabbis say, but the copy has to be with the rabbi, you have to get special permission. Right off the bat, you know, it's like, no, you know what it's like? It's like having the filter on the internet. I'm watching what you're reading, you know? Imagine an average guy, I mean, <laughs> what kind of a guy goes to the rabbi, rabbi Heinemann and says, I'd like to borrow a copy <laughs> of the morning name of Isaiah de Ross. Like, what? You think? Uh, uh, now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you a good part. This book is unreadable. It's written horrible. It's written horribly. Everybody knows this. It's written in rabbinic Hebrew, not in, 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 in uh, biblical Hebrew. As a double you do, it's very hard to get through. He brings one proof after another from the most obscure people, and you know some of it is very learned. Some of the people he bought into are famous forgers that they didn't know about at the time, Viterbo and the people. You know, it's in there. And he brings one, and, and it's erudite. So he brings one after another. You have to have a lot of this flesh to get through to the good stuff, so to speak, you understand? And so it's not, a, it's not really a danger, it's gonna become a bestseller in Barnes & Noble. You get it? This will be a, one of those books on the shelf if there ever, if there ever was one, you have to understand. In, in 1578, a few years after he dies in Mantua, uh, in 1600, which is 22 years later, an 80-year-old rabbi called the Maral of Prague, maybe you've heard of him, uh, publishes an attack on the book. 22 years after Azari died, called the Be'er Agola. I can guarantee you the Be'er Agola is 100 times more famous than, uh, and read by a million more people as the Maral, the Maral, than the book that he wrote it against. Okay? Now, obviously, why is he writing this 25 years, a quarter century after the death of the author? This stuff must have, copies must have gotten to Prague, must have really gotten under the skin of the Maral. He had a big yeshiva. We know the Maral had a big yeshiva. That, and if you have a big yeshiva, you have guys on the right, you have guys on the left, you have guys in the middle. There was an interest in the Maral's yeshiva in history. The Tzemach David, one of the famous early Ashkenazi history books, comes from out of his yeshiva from a David Gans. It's of a different nature. But the Tzemach David, by the way, talks about his Ida Ross. He said it's a very interesting book. Of course, we don't hold that way, but that's what he writes. You know, he went a little too far, but it's a very interesting book. And so really get a gun under his uh, skin. He curses Azariah, all right? He said, this guy, both straight, he had one-way ticket to hell for what he did. He said, I can't believe a Jew talks this way. It sounds like it sounds like come from the Catholic Church, the way he's making fun of the uh, Chazal. Um, but he doesn't disprove the arguments, you understand? Uh, the Maral was not really into history. Again, that's not who he was. The Maral was a great Tom Chacham and Gemara and, and the Shas and Postkim and all that. And the Maral is into, into uh, I guess you call it theosophy. No, it's religious philosophy how God operates in the world. That's the Kisri morale that fascinates people till today. I would say the morale is the most important and seminal influence on modern from Jewish thought in the last 500 years. I believe I'm right about that. His ideas and thought, especially now in the last 100 years, you know, with the Hasidim or of Dessler and all the rest of it, the Yeshivasha, Machshavas, and uh, Hashkafa, as they call it, all heavily influenced by the ideas of the morale, not by <laughs> the Rossi. Uh, he applies... For our purposes, the morale applies to historical agatitas, the approach of the Rambam to anthropomorphic agatitas. You understand? Which is that, oh, you don't take it literally, but you don't make fun of it either. And by that I mean, I'll, I'll just give you one example with, with which I started. He said like this, how can you say they made up the story the bugger went up the nose? You think they're liars? They just tell myths in order to keep the people happy. Then the rabbi is a bunch of manipulators of public opinion, the outrageous scoundrels, and all the rest of it. Here's rather what happened. The bug represents a tumor. The, the, it, when the bug went up the nose, he doesn't use this language because he's writing in the 16th century, but it's fascinating to those of you who are doctors will read it. It represents a little organism that starts biting away at the thing and little by little metastasizing, and it spreads bigger and bigger. By the time it's finished, and by the time when they make the autopsy, 
it's you know what's in his head you know what do they find in the skull a huge tumor with so to speak with so to speak I emphasize with iron uh, things which was terribly painful no question about it I mean if this is true uh, Titus had a horrible death agreed I mean, there was no no medicine I mean even today it's it's a, it's a horrible death but there was no bug up the nose <laughs> right now even when he said it but to, but the morale will say like this he said but you have to understand when they use this imagery. They weren't interested in the historicity of it. They were trying to convey a point. They conveyed the idea that the tumor, they described it in the form, because they didn't use the modern scientific language, they go, the tumor in, in a vivid form, as they say, of the bird and all the rest. But you can read it in English, by the way. Um, the Be'er Hagola has been translated more or less substantially by Rabbi Adlerstein and uh, it's published by Art Scroll. Okay? Uh, I'm sure somebody must have a copy or something like that. And, uh, you know, he didn't translate it word for word uh, because the Maral is very wordy, but he does give the basic idea of it. It's a, it's a whole bunch of agatas that are strange. And uh, this one about Titus is, is, is very interesting uh, to read, as they say before. And after screaming at him about all the rest of it, he also doesn't assert the historicity that an actual bugger went up the nose. You understand? But rather, as, as, a, as a metaphor, but the, it's, it's of a completely different way of expressing the metaphor. It's a sublime metaphor, uh, presented by great experts in sublimity who know how to convey uh, deep theological messages uh, to the masses instead of saying it's a bunch of rabbis made up a myth, you know, a fairy tale because they're trying to, like the Brothers Grimm or something like that, you know, and trying to show you the big bad uh, Titus got what's coming to him. And therein lies an uh, entire hashkafic world of difference, you see? And uh, there, now by the way, the morale doesn't deal with the question, did Titus die of a brain tumor? Uh, which I'm not sure how you could